object orientation is not about objects. Yes, I know. I know what you're thinking. If objects are not what it's all about, why is it called object orientation? Let me explain. I'm Hugh and this is the third lesson in my series on the principles of object-oriented programming. These principles may apply to pretty much, well, any object-oriented language, C Sharp, Java, C++, Ruby or whatever, but to understand them fully we are going back to the language that first brought object orientation into the mainstream and that is Smalltalk. As I mentioned in an earlier video, Alan Kay, the principal designer of Smalltalk, said that he regrets that he ever coined the term objects, which led to all those programming languages being called object-oriented. Now the big idea, Alan Kay said, is not objects but messaging. This series is based around the excellent guide to object-oriented programming supplied with an old 80s Smalltalk system, Smalltalk V. And you can download the PDF of that tutorial by following the link below. We now come to the interesting question, what are objects? If you've programmed in some other object-oriented language, you may think you already know the answer to that, but don't be too hasty. There's more to this than you may think. Now, the first sentence here is straightforward. A Smalltalk object is simply related pieces of code and data. The pieces of code, which in non-OOP languages we'd call functions, are here called methods. The data are the variables internal to the object, known as its instance variables, because an object is an instance, a one-off example, of the sort of thing that is defined by a class. So far, so much just like Java, C, Sharp, and all those other languages that you may already know. But this is the paragraph I really want to focus on. Related data and program pieces are encapsulated within a Smalltalk object, a communicating black box. The black box can send and receive certain messages. Message passing is the only means of importing data for local manipulation within the black box. And if an object needs something done that it does not know how to do within its own set of methods, it sends a message to another object, in effect asking for assistance in the completion of a task. Now remember what Alan Kay said, the big idea is not objects, but messaging. But why is that so important? If you've learnt object orientation with C-sharp or Java, my bet is that you've learnt all about classes and objects, inheritance and maybe polymorphism, but messaging? Maybe you haven't even heard of it before watching the videos in this series. So let's backtrack a couple of pages in the Smalltalk V tutorial. On page 11, we come to a section called The World According to Objects. In order to understand message passing, you may need to forget what you think you know about objects, as they are used, I mean, in modern programming languages, and go back to the original ideas of object orientation as developed in Smalltalk. Now, Smalltalk, we are told, is built on the simple yet powerful model of communicating objects. On the next page, there are a couple of diagrams to illustrate this. We see a sender object that passes a message, and a receiver object that receives that message. The next diagram uses a real-world example with human occupations shown as though they were a system of objects. Each occupation is seen as a class, here, a class provides the general description of an occupation. To be a member of a trucker class, you would have to know how to drive a truck. Here, Barbara, Fred and Elton are all members of the trucker class. So in object-oriented terms, they are instances of that class, or we could say they are trucker objects. Taking this idea further, on page 13, the tutorial says to become a lawyer, we learn legal methods. Communications between individuals are comparable to small talk messages. So a method is something an object does. A message is a request to an object to do something. Your code can send a message to an object and, all being well, the object will have a method of dealing with that message. But isn't a method just a function? And isn't a message, well, just a function call? In other object-oriented languages, it may seem that way. A function call is, in effect, a command to do something. But here's Alan Kay again. Messages can't be commands. Hmm. So what's the big deal then? Here's the Smalltalk V tutorial. Related data and program pieces are encapsulated within a Smalltalk object, a communicating black box. 
The black box can send and receive certain messages. Message passing is the only means of importing data for local manipulation within the black box, and if an object needs something done that it does not know how to do within its own set of methods, it sends a message to another object, in effect asking for assistance in the completion of a task. Now, taking the analogy with lawyers a bit further, stretching it, Almost a breaking point, in fact, the tutorial tells us that you cannot get direct memory access to a lawyer's or to an accountant's knowledge. That knowledge is firmly embedded inside the lawyer or in the accountant. The only way you can get at it is by making a request. Well, actually, you also have to pay some money, but we'll ignore that bit for now. The big idea as it applies to object orientation is that an individual person's knowledge is not directly available to me or to you. We can only get at it by issuing a request and that person then responds, ideally by providing the information we want or quite possibly by telling us they don't have the information or the ability to deal with our request. So the lawyer or the accountant or the trucker or the doctor are like black boxes. The exact details of their knowledge and skills, what's inside them, is unknown to us. What we do know is that they can do useful things because we know the type of job they have. In object-oriented terms, we know their class. On page 12, this is the example the tutorial gives. Break a leg, call in a doctor and tell him or her about your condition. You trust the doctor's special knowledge and skills to help make you better. Self communicates with Dr. Black Box. Here, self means whatever object calls the doctor object. Self sends a message, I've got a headache. Dr. Black Box replies, take some aspirins. You could imagine writing a simple doctor class in a program that does something like that. The point is that the code that calls the doctor object does not have access to the data, the variables or the code, the implementation details of the methods of the doctor object. To put it another way, the internal details of the doctor object are not directly available to code outside that object. In object-oriented terms, information hiding, as the encapsulation of code and data is known in computer science, makes for highly portable, easily modifiable and safe software. Now look at that sentence again. It defines what encapsulation is. It says encapsulation is information hiding. That may not be the definition of encapsulation that you are familiar with. Look at encapsulation on Wikipedia. This says, in software systems, encapsulation refers to the bundling of data with the mechanisms or methods that operate on the data. In other words, encapsulation means putting both variables and functions inside a class definition rather than scattering them across your code files as in procedural languages. Now, to be fair to Wikipedia, it does then add this. It may also refer to the limiting of direct access to some of that data, which makes information hiding sound like an optional extra. Whereas in the Smalltalk V tutorial, information hiding is fundamental. In fact, information hiding and encapsulation are described as one and the same thing. I like this description from John Hunt's book Smalltalk and Object Orientation. He says encapsulation is the process of hiding all the details of an object that do not contribute to its essential characteristics. Essentially, it means that what is inside the class is hidden. Only the external interfaces are known by other objects. That is, as the user of an object, you should never need to look inside the box. And this is Adele Goldberg, who is one of the developers of Smalltalk 80 in the book Smalltalk 80, The Language and Its Implementation. Objects support modularity. The functioning of any object does not depend on the internal details of other objects. And just in case you still need to be convinced, let's see what Dan Ingalls has to say. He was the principal architect of the early environments of Smalltalk 80, as well as one of the developers of Squeak Smalltalk, which is the Smalltalk I'm using in this series. Here is Dan in the 1981 Byte special issue devoted to Smalltalk. Modularity. No component in a complex system should depend on the internal details of any other component. Modularity, that's what it all comes down to. The problem is, to modern programmers, modularity can mean many things. It means different things to different programmers. Sometimes people call just any old code file a module. In some languages, a module has a special meaning. In Ruby, for example, a module can be imported or mixed into the code of a class. 
Is that what small talk means by modularity? And anyway, why does it make such a big fuss about modularity? Now, in fact, modularity was one of the big ideas that would have been seen as fundamental to the creating of clean, maintainable code back in the 1980s. Small talk wasn't the only language that was big on modularity. For example, there was Modular 2. That language was so big on mod modularity that it gave the game away in its very name. In the next lesson, I'll have more to say on modularity in the small talk sense, and I'll try to figure out if we can make programs in other object-oriented languages truly modular. To be sure you don't miss any of my videos, subscribe and click that bell. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and leave a comment down below if you want. And I'll see you again soon.